everyone, and welcome to church today. I'm Joab Perdue, and this is Pastor Mystic Davis, and she's our pastor of all of our Hero Land area from birth through kindergarten. It's great to have you today, Pastor Mystic. Well, I'm glad to be here and glad to be here at church with you all online. And we've got a powerful week ahead, and we even have a powerful day ahead. Uh, pastor Jimmy Evans is sure. in the house, and uh, we're in the middle of a, a, a just started last week a brand new series. Would you yes, like to tell I'd us about that? I'd love to tell us about it. It is all on marriage relationships, just the title of it, Together Forever. Mm. And pastor Jimmy Evans is such an anointed pastor over marriage, carries such authority over relationships. So if you are married and wanting to just work on marriage, just even here, the way to do it God's way, this series is one you will want to be a part of. Don't miss it. Um, come to church and um, watch online every week. And if you've missed the start of this series, you can find it online. Make sure to catch every message that Pastor Jimmy will share. Um, and again, this is a marriage series. However, it is so impactful for anyone uh, in all relationships. So. I love, last right. week was so powerful. God spoke to me about, I mean, the basis of any relationship That's is, right. A, we gotta get our mega needs met from Jesus. We can't get our Jesus needs met from a person. And so it's really powerful. And we also, as we, as you know, we have a big week of things happening here at Trinity. We yeah. seems like we always have a lot always of great have. opportunities, uh, a lot of ways for you to grow and invest in your personal growth. And because uh, we want to grow stronger around here at Trinity. And so this week we have Hearing God. It is on April 16th and 17th. So if you would like to learn more about hearing the voice of the Lord, you know, when people say, man, I heard God say this, or I feel like God is leading me this way. This is a amazing, amazing clinic on this where you get to actively practice doing this. Now, this is an in-person only event, so you'll need to go online and register, and we'd love to have you at Hearing God. Yes, and those events are always just something. Take that step. There is, like we keep saying, there is something for you. And so, I'm just coming ready to learn more and grow more in that. And on that note, there is always something for you. There is a next step. We have water baptism happening next Sunday. I love it. One of our favorite weekends it of the my month. Favorite. It is always I love it. so fun. And so, watching online, if online church is kind of your rhythm, your flow, and um, we love having you, just come on, show up at an, an in-person campus for Baptism Sunday. If you have not been water baptized yet, all you need to do is show up. We will have everything for you, everything that we need. We have baptism teams ready to serve you and give you, um, just set up for all that you need to show up, take that next step. Um, if that has been on your heart, just you have pursued relationship with Jesus, you've been watching church online, been coming to church, been growing in that relationship, water baptism is your next step. It is such an incredible decision, yep. uh, really life-changing. And we love to celebrate with you here at Trinity as your church family. We yep. want to do this with you and encourage you in that. So next Sunday, show up for water baptisms. We've got you covered and excited for that. All you need to do is come 30 minutes before whichever <laughs> service you attend and yeah. sign up in the foyer. Uh, people will help you get, get to where you need to get to get changed and everything. Also, we have the Growth Track Slam. Uh, you may say, what is that? Well, the Growth Track is a series of four classes that uh, we go through to learn about our church membership, who you are in the Lord, the essentials of the Christian faith, and also how you get a, to be a part of serving here at Trinity. If you would like to come and be some of those uh, dream teamers who are serving in the parking lot or helping out in Hero Land, we That's love right. our dream yes. teamers. We yes. couldn't make church happen without you. So the Growth Track Slam is a one-night event. You know, kind of like when you hit a Grand Slam in baseball, you get them all done in one night. This is something we offer very uh, rarely, so sign up. This is a very special opportunity, and it's happening Tuesday night, April 30th. But go online to tfc.org, 
slash growth track and sign up for the growth track slam. That's right. And that's all online on Zoom. So it can be convenient for you. And um, that's where you are able to take your next step of becoming a member and then just being a part of this church family, serving, leading. We want you a part of this healthy family. Well, let me pray for us and we'll get started. And we're so excited you're here for church today. Lord Jesus, we bless our online congregation. We thank you for what you're doing. God, we come together with you today. We worship you, Jesus. We invite your presence in every space we're at. We thank you for your presence. Let's worship him together today, church. Amen. Family, would you stand to your feet with me? It is a beautiful day the Lord's made this morning. And he's worthy of our praise, so let's jump straight into worship. Let's honor our God together. Father, we thank you for who you are. We worship your name. In Jesus' name, let's worship.
give you praise this morning. We thank you, Jesus. Come on all over this room. Can we give God praise this morning? We love you, Jesus. So glad to be in your presence. What peace in your presence, God. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Born of his spirit and washed in his blood, and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. Oh, so I trust in God, my Savior. That's why I trust him. 
sing in church. He will never fail. Oh, I'm so grateful. Oh, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Come on, lift those hands with me and worship the King who can be trusted with all of our lives. is my firm foundation, yeah, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad I put my faith in Jesus, he's never let me down, he's faithful through change. Sing it out.
Jesus, we thank you today that you will never fail. We put our trust in you. Just tell them right there, say, Jesus, I trust you. We thank you that you are our rock and our salvation. And you are God who we can completely trust with our whole life. So we come to you today and we say thank you that you had a plan all along to choose us, to come after us. And even here in your presence, you have a plan to remind us of the rock on which we stand. This morning, church, I am bringing you a reminder that I have already fitted you with the shoes of peace. That there is no more condemnation for those who are in me. And the peace that you experience is a peace because there's relationship, right relationship that I have with you, my child. So as you came in today, maybe wondering, maybe wavering, where you might have stood with me, receive my peace. It's a gospel of peace. It's a peace that provides understanding. It's a peace that reminds you of my grace and my love for you. Take in my peace. Wear my peace on your head and on your heart. Because my peace for you, my child, is to remind you that there's no more condemnation, but also it's a conquering peace. The peace that I have for you allows you to move from mountain to mountain, not afraid of any trials and tribulations, not shrinking back. This peace, the peace I have for you, allows you to walk in spaces that maybe you would have shied away from any other circumstance. But as you walk with me, my child, knowing who you are in me and who I am in you, the peace that I give you allows you to carry my peace and my kingdom everywhere you go. So that situation this morning, the relationship you came in with that felt rocky and uneven and it's maybe anxious and stressful to even try to press in, I want you to know when you choose to walk there with my peace, my presence is there. And when my presence is there, you can know that you are more than a conqueror through me who loves you. So today, Father, we say thank you for your peace. We choose to receive it for ourselves, but also to walk with the peace that you give us into the world around us. Thank you that you are a God who leads us and guides us. And we choose to follow you today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, church family, if you're thankful, for Jesus and his peace. Why don't you put your hands together? So amazing. Hey, I'm so excited to be here worshiping with all of you today. Why don't you do me a favor? Turn around right there where you are. Give someone a high five or a hug as you make your way to your seats. We're so glad you're here today. At Trinity, family is important and we'd love for you to be a part of our church family. The best place to start is Growth Track. There, you'll learn more about Trinity Fellowship and how to live out your unique calling in the church body. And as a church family, we love God and we want to be obedient to Him, which is why we honor His command in Malachi 3.10 to bring our tithes, the first 10% of our income, to the storehouse, the local church. He commands this not for His sake, but for ours. He wants our whole heart and every area of our life to be submitted to Him. You can find more information about Growth Track as well as a link to give in the TFC app. Not only that, but you'll find all sorts of other resources, including events, podcasts, weekend messages, and more. Again, it's great to be with you. God has something amazing for you today. Good morning, everybody. All services and campuses, good morning. It is great to be here this morning. and. Uh, let me say to all services, all campuses, next Sunday is water baptisms. At every campus and every service, all you have to do is just show up. Uh, they have a change of clothes and towel and everything like that. So if you have not been water baptized since you received Christ, it's a commandment. You need to be water baptized. And some people you know, wonder about the significance of being water baptized. 
Well, first of all, it's a commandment, but the New Testament calls water baptism the circumcision of Christ. And so you remember the, in the Old Testament, their circumcision, which was a physical circumcision in the covenant of Abraham, but this is a circumcision of the heart. And what that means is when you go down in the baptistry, in the baptismal waters, Jesus says something with your heart. Something in your heart changes, and it enhances your relationship with him. People who are not water baptized, you know, you can be saved and go to heaven, but there's something that's not the same in your heart, and it prevents the relationship with Jesus being as close as it should be. In some cases, it prevents you from hearing God the way you should be able to hear God. And so it's a commandment, but it's not just getting wet in front of people. It is Jesus doing something supernatural and us being obedient uh, to the Lord. And th this is what I, I say, and that is, I've never met a person who was not water baptized who ever lived a great Christian life. Because if you won't do the first thing that God commanded you to do, it's doubtful you're going to do much else. So this is a very important first step of saying, Jesus, I'm a public Christian. I'm not just a private Christian. And I'm an obedient believer. I, you're my Lord. And I'm going to be obedient to you. Next weekend, very easy. Any service, just show up. They've got towels, change of clothes, and we will water baptize you. And you can know from that point forward that you have been obedient to the Lord in that area. And it will make a difference in your life spiritually. Uh, let me make a statement regarding Israel. I'm going to preach on uh, marriage again this morning. Yesterday, Iran bombed Israel. 500 or so drones, surface, to, uh, surface rockets, things like that. About a week ago, Israel bombed the Iranian consulate uh, in Damascus, Syria, killing a general and some other high-ranking officials. As soon as they did that, uh, Iran, you know, said we're going to strike you hard and all that kind of stuff. Um, the Israelis are not perfect. I want to say this anytime I'm talking about Israel. They're not perfect, but they are in a special relationship with God by covenant. God made an everlasting covenant to Abraham, Genesis 17, to him and to his descendants uh, and to the land of Israel. And Israel is just in this impossible situation. October 7th happened and Hamas savagely uh, attacked Israel, uh, killing about 1,200 people, taking others hostage. I went to the uh, Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. in January, and I watched a 45-minute video of the attacks. This was the, much of the footage came from the Hamas terrorists, from their own phones, their own social media. And we saw 139 Israelis butchered. And the whole time they're butchering them, they're praising Allah. It was a worship service. They're praising Allah, killing men, women, and children. Before they showed us the video, they told us that they had edited out what they did to the babies. It's horrific. And so after October 7th, the world turned against Israel and for Hamas and for the Palestinians. And pro-Palestinian demonstrations all over in my neighborhood in Dallas, there was a big pro-Palestinian demonstration and things like that. The anti-Semitism is just off the charts. We haven't seen anything like this since the Holocaust. And this is exactly what the Bible said would happen at the end. Uh, the Bible says that the, the very end of this age, the whole world would march against Jerusalem. As, as crazy as that sounds, right now the whole world's attention is there. So Israel, Iran has been using Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, terrorists in the West Bank, all those people uh, to attack Israel uh, since before and since October 7th, but it certainly escalated since October 7th. And Iran has been behind it all. They have financed it all. They've orchestrated it all and never gotten their hands dirty. I, now, this is my opinion. I believe that Israel intentionally bombed the consulate in uh, Damascus. They intentionally did that to draw Iran out. They wanted them mano y mano and for them to stop hiding behind all their proxies. And that's exactly what happened. So yesterday when they attacked, the good news is the international community this morning is condemning what Iran did. Iran has been getting billions of dollars. We released, the Biden administration released $10 billion to Iran. They've had no consequences for all the mayhem and evil they have caused in that area. But now, hopefully, there will be some consequences. The difficulty in this situation today, and by the way, yesterday when they were being bombed, the, the, the Iron Dome worked. The, there were, the, the articles that I read this morning, there was no penetration of uh, Israel airspace. There was no damage. There was no loss of life. Now, Iran is claiming that they had victory and all this stuff happened. But it seems as though that it was just completely stopped. Uh, the, you know, our uh, army shot down, Air Force shot down a lot of the missiles. Jordan's Air Force shot down a lot of missiles, uh, thankfully. But 
the, there will be a response. Israel right now is calculating their response. The uh, United Nations Security Council is meeting today to decide what they're going to do uh, in uh, whatever they do. They'll end up probably condemning Israel because that's who they are. But um, Israel, we are urging Israel, the United States government is urging Israel not to respond. Now, it's not like Israel not to respond. This is an existential threat to them. They're surrounded by enemies. Uh, Israel can take care of Iran and everybody else in short order. They're very, very powerful. But they have to be careful because if they over-respond, the world opinion could turn against them again just like it has before. So they're, they're just in this impossible situation exactly the way the Bible said it would happen in the end times. And so um, we're going to pray. I want us to pray together for this situation and to say God loves Iranians. Did, did you know... The biggest revival in the world is happening in Iran right now. And so the, there's a, a man named Dr. Hormoz Shariot, uh, and he is the Billy Graham of Iran. He's the one leading the evangelism in Iran. And I had him on my podcast a few months ago. He'll be on my podcast again next uh, month. But he says the Iranian people love America. They love Israel. Uh, they're very, you know, pro-Israel, pro-America. But they hate their government. The Iranian government does not represent the Iran Iranian people. The Iranian people are wonderful people. And so, but the, the Iranian government is a Muslim government and they're vowed to the destruction of Israel. They, they believe Allah has called them to destroy Israel and usher in the end times. That's their eschatology. That's their end times theology. And so, I don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, and some people are saying, you know, World War III will break out or something like that. I don't believe that's going to happen. Uh, there are wars prophesied. The Psalm 83 war is basically happening right now. It's just a, Israel surrounded by their enemies in that war. There's a war, uh, the Gog and Magog war, Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is Russia, Iran, Turkey, and some North African nations. Well, that, that's already unfolding as we're talking. If Israel bombs Iran, um, especially their nuclear facilities, and hits them hard, the Gog and Magog war could break out. Now, the good news about the Gog and Magog war is that Israel wins. God, they don't have to fire a bullet. God destroys those nations on, on his own. So I don't know exactly what's going to happen next, but the world is very fragile and Israel is in a very, very vulnerable situation. And so would you just, let, just join me in prayer, all the campuses and services watching. Lord, we come and we know that you love people. You love the Arab people. You love the Iranian people. You love the Israeli people, uh, but you have a special covenant with Israel. And they are right now in just an impossible situation. Give wisdom to Prime Minister Netanyahu, to the Knesset, to the IDF. Give them wisdom so that they would have just supernatural wisdom from you in whatever they do next. We pray for supernatural protection upon Israel, Lord, that you would keep them from all of their enemies, Lord. And we know we're living in the end times. We know the Bible prophecy is coming true, Lord. And we just, you said when you see these things happen, to look up and lift up our heads, our redemption is drawing near. And Jesus, we look forward to you coming and taking us out. Until we go, we are here and we are committed to doing your work. But bless Israel today and protect them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we have a website called endtimes.com. And this is uh, something that I do every week. I have... Uh, a podcast that comes out every Wednesday on endtimes.com. Endtimes.com, there's a free side. There's a, subscri a subscription side at $7 a month. But on uh, this morning, I do a, it's called a good word. I do a devotional every Sunday uh, that's posted every Sunday. And then on Tuesday, we have a correspondent in Israel. named Brian Schrager. And we do an Israel update every Tuesday. Brian will be on my podcast this Wednesday. Uh, he's a professional journalist and he's our correspondent over there. And I'll be interviewing him about what's going on over in Israel. Uh, but Brian has his own podcast on, on Tuesdays. Mine is on Wednesdays. Dr. Mark Hitchcock is really the foremost uh, end times expert. Uh, he, is going to, he has a podcast every Thursday on endtimes.com. We have breaking news. We have articles. We have all kinds of stuff. We answer questions about the Bible in the end times every week. And so if that's something that interests you, that's endtimes.com. And we also have a conference our End Time Prophecy Conference every September. And it's coming up, I think it's the 20th and 21st of September this year at Fellowship Church uh, in Dallas. And we have Dr. David Jeremiah, who's gonna be there on Friday night, uh, joining us via video, but he's, the, he's just a very brilliant guy. Uh, the, we have Max Locato, we have, uh, Dr., we have Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, a lot of great speakers there. So if that's something that interests you, you can also go on endtimes.com 
and see that. We talk about marriage and reconcilable differences is the uh, title of this message. Reconcilable differences, you know, we're very different. I don't know if you notice, if you're married, we're, we're very different. Uh, and some of those differences are good and some of those are bad. And I'll talk about that in the message. But you've heard of irreconcilable differences. When relationships fail, when marriages fail, a lot of times what you hear is, well, we just had irreconcilable differences. Well, I want to talk about differences and how to reconcile differences because we're very different. Now, first of all, I want to talk, just talk about riding in the car together as married couples. <laughs> And this nervous, every time I say that, the nervous laughter breaks out because we know that's a... And so, you know, I hear about a lot of couples fighting uh, in the car, problems starting in the car. I really don't ever hear about something getting better in the car uh, or resolving a conflict. I've never heard a person say to me, you know, Jimmy, when we're having problems, we like to get in the car. And it's, it's our safe place. A couple of hours riding, heavy traffic, we're all good. I've never heard that. And... Uh, it's like whatever is wrong outside the car gets worse in the car. You're frustrated outside the car, you're angry in the car. You're angry in the, in the, outside the car, you're furious inside the car. And this is heresy, what I'm about to say here, Pastor Jimmy. And I'll make it right here in just a minute. But I'm not sure that Jesus is with us when we're in the car together. <laughs> and I know that's probably heresy. He's omnipresent, you know, and, and I know he's in the car when I'm there by myself. But I think, I think when we get into the car as couples, Jesus is like, I'm not riding with y'all. I'm too holy to spend 30 minutes in the car with you two. And that, that is heresy, so let me repent. But anyway, after 50 years of marriage, uh, this, is, this is still an issue with Karen and me. I mean, you know, she doesn't like the way I drive. I don't like the way she drives. Basically, two cars have saved our marriage. And, um, you know, and I'm a, I'm a backseat driver. She's a backseat driver. It's hard not to say something when your life is in danger. That's, that's the way I feel about it. And so the car is a stressful environment. And here's the, here's the dynamic in the car, part of the issue. Only one person can be in control of the car. So here's, here's the dynamic. One person's in control of the car, and the other person is trying to control the person who's in control of the car. And so that's the dynamic when you're riding together. And so Karen, you know, it's just like I said, it's, always, it's a challenge. So I'll be driving, and I'll go through a light, and Karen will say, you ran that light. I said, I didn't ride in that light. It was dark orange. It was not red. It was just... <laughs> And then the next, the next, you know, intersection, I'll stop, and she'll say, you could have made that. <laughs> it's just, it drives you nuts. And Karen has this app on her phone called Waze, W-A-Z-E. Anybody have that app on their phone? Well, it makes her the resident expert on all things driving. And the first thing she does when we get in the car is she looks at Waze. And she says, well, Waze will tell us where the wrecks are. I said, I don't want to know where they are. I like surprises. I don't, I, 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 I don't care. And then she, and so we'll go, we're, we're going to some place we've been a thousand times and she'll tell me how to go. Waze is telling us how to go. And she'll sit there and say, well, Waze is saying you need to go this way. And, you know, it just gets on my nerves. So one day I said to her, Karen, your ways are not my ways. And I had to quote the Bible to the sister and get her off my back. And, but, so you say, what's the answer? I don't know. But on social media, when I was preparing this message, I, I asked on social media, on XO, I said, uh, how do you resolve stress in the car when you're riding together? And a lot of people wrote in. They said, well, we pray. When we get in the car, the first thing we do is pray. That's a great idea, uh, praying in the car. The other couple, several couples said, we just hold hands. We hold, regardless of what happens, we never stop holding hands. We're always holding hands. And this one lady wrote in, and she said, well, the way I resolve stress in riding with my husband, she said, I drink margaritas and stare out my window. <laughs> and... And I wouldn't recommend that. Don't, don't do that. But that's what she said. And so there are two kinds of differences in marriage. There are bad differences and there are God differences. And you have to resolve both of them. You have to be able to reconcile the bad differences and the God difference. Let me start with the bad differences. And this is what healed our marriage. Uh, Karen and I almost divorced after several years of marriage. And this is Genesis 2:24 and 25. This cause a man will leave his father and mother will cleave unto his wife, they too shall become one flesh, and the man and his wife were naked and unashamed. Well, now, that looks like kind of an innocuous verse. By the way, those are the words God spoke when he created Eve for Adam. When the first marriage was created, God spoke those words, okay? So, some people would say, well, God just spoke those words over Adam and Eve. We absolutely know that that's not true, because God says here, for this cause a man will leave his father and mother, Adam and Eve didn't have mothers, Adam and Eve were directly created by God. 
So what God was saying when he spoke these words were, these are the laws of marriage that are inviolable and eternal. Every marriage will have to follow these laws. And so I didn't know that there were laws creating, uh, regarding marriage. But listen to this. Everything God creates has order because of laws. The universe, the physical universe that we see and experience, there's predictability, there's safety, and there's order because there are physical laws that govern, like the law of gravity. And if you obey those laws, and whether you understand them or not, if you obey the laws and honor those, then you're, you're going to have a happy life. If you disobey, if you get on your roof and jump off, you're going to hurt yourself because gravity doesn't care who you are. It's impersonal. And neither do these laws here. God created these laws so that we could have order, predictability, and safety in marriage. A lot of people believe that marriage is a dangerous relationship. It's the safest relationship on earth. And you have a 100% chance of success when you do it God's way. So here are the four laws of marriage. Number one is the law of priority. For this cause, a man will leave his father and his mother. It has to be first. Marriage has to be first. It won't work in any other place. And father and mother, by the way, that's your closest blood bond before you get married. And God says, for this cause, for the cause of marriage, you have to leave your father and mother. Well, here's what the word leave means in the Hebrew. It means this. It means let go. Is you have to reprioritize. doesn't mean you're mean to him or that you reject them. It just means you're not as important as my spouse. And you may have heard the statement, you know, the saying, blood is thicker than water. Um, and that just means you stick with family, you stick with blood. Let me give you another statement. Blood may be thicker than water, but spirit is thicker than blood. And Jesus said, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. The spirit bond between a married couple is more profound than the blood bond between a family. And so God says you have to reprioritize. In real terms, your marriage has to be more important than your children. Children are temporary assignment. They come, they go. They're 18, 19, 37, they leave someday. <laughs> We're thankful for that. And so they're temporary. But your marriage is permanent. And the other thing is how are your children going to succeed in marriage if you don't show them how? And if you give up your marriage for your children, you're short-sighted. You love your children. There's God, there's marriage, and then there's your children. They're important, but they're not as important as your marriage. Your work, your friends, social media, sports, fill in the blank. You have to prove to your spouse that they're first every single day. And if they're not, they'll get jealous and you'll begin to have fights because it's a law. It's, it's, these are not principles. These are laws. It's inviolable. Number two is the law of pursuit. Is a man will leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. That word cleave there means to work with all your energy. It's a very, very energy-laden uh, word. And so God says from the beginning, you've got to work at this relationship. Many people believe if you have to work at marriage, there's something wrong with it. If you married your perfect soulmate, you would just wake up every day and be in love and just hallelujah, you know, you're just so beautiful and you're so handsome and all that kind of stuff. There's no such thing. Every marriage, you have to work at the relationship. And to the degree that you work at the relationship is to the degree it works. What other area of life can you not work and succeed? What, what area of life? So in marriage, God said from the very beginning, you're going to have to cleave. You're going to have to work at the relationship. Number three law is the law of partnership. It says they two should become one. And marriage is about sharing. We share everything. And so we share children. We share finances. We share decisions. And so dominance and selfishness are the two enemies of law of partnership. And I was dominant and selfish when Karen and I got married. And it destroyed our marriage. And by the way, dominance is gender neutral. There are as many dominant women as there are dominant men. And dominance just means this. In the company of our marriage, I own more stock than you. I have, I have a bigger voice than you. My, my voice makes, I make the decisions. And so things like that. And so in a marriage, you own 50-50. You make all of your decisions together and you share everything. You, some, in some marriages, you literally have two people just living separate lives in the same house. And they call that a marriage. Marriage is about sharing. And because we have to talk about everything, that's where closeness comes from. That's where intimacy comes from. We share. And so when Karen and I make decisions, we, we pray about it and we talk until we come make decisions. We don't bully each other. We don't, we don't pressure each other. We talk. Every decision in our home, every decision has three names on it. Jesus, Karen, and Jimmy. There's no decision in the home, no significant decision that has my name on it alone or her name on it alone. And so it's the law of partnership. You have to share. You can't dominate or be selfish. Number four is the law of purity. It says the man and his wife were both naked and unashamed. And that's, that's a pretty shocking thing in the world we live in. They were completely naked, but it doesn't mean physically naked only. 
It means mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically, they were completely exposed to each other and they had no fear whatsoever. They'd never been hurt. They'd never been rejected. And so they were just completely naked and until they sinned. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they began to hide themselves from each other. They couldn't be innocent and trusting any longer. And the law of purity is this. You can only have intimacy in your marriage to the degree that you're careful in your words and actions and to the degree that you take responsibility for what you did wrong. And so in marriage, I've got to be careful. So I wounded Karen with my mouth. I was just selfish, dominant, said some really bad stuff for the first three years of our marriage. And when I repented to her on the night we almost separated, when I repented to Karen, the first thing she said when I said I was sorry, she said, your mouth. And see, Proverbs 18 says the power of life and death is in our tongues. The words are nuclear. And the things that we say to each other, they deeply want, they can bless, but they can also curse. They can give life, they can give death. And the same mouth that killed Karen brought her back to life. When I changed and when I began to take responsibility for what I was doing. So marriage is a very simple thing. It's very simple. At, at 22 years old, when we almost divorced, I saw the four laws of marriage. The Lord led me to Genesis 2. I saw the four laws of marriage. And here's what I thought. I've broken every law every day. No wonder we have a rotten marriage. I have broken every single law of marriage every single day. The second thing I thought was this. I can do that. Here's how complicated marriage is. It has to be first. You have to work at it. You have to share and you have to be careful. That's, that's as complicated as it gets. And I thought to myself at 22 years old, by myself, I can do that. And I did it. And I came home. I put a I saw playing golf was the thing that almost destroyed our marriage. I hung up my golf clubs. For three years, I hung up my golf clubs. And the next time I played golf, Karen came and said to me, would you please go play golf? I think I was on her nerves. You know, we, and uh, so I said, excuse me, I think I hear angels singing. And <laughs> so I went to play, play golf. Um, she didn't mind me playing golf. She minded golf coming before her. I began to work and meet her needs. I began to share and stop being dominant. And I started being careful and taking responsibility. It healed our marriage. We went from having a horrible marriage to having a great marriage. And uh, in the way, by the way, the way I came on staff here at the church 42 years ago was I was in business. And the pastor, Larry Titus, hired me as a marriage and pre-marriage counselor because everybody came to us for counseling. And we never, we never told anybody we could help in marriage. But that's, that's how it happened. And so the bad differences in your marriage evaporate with the four laws of marriage. How do you reconcile your bad differences? You put it first, you work at the marriage, you share, and you're careful. The bad differences evaporate. And I know that from personal example. But there aren't just bad differences, there are God differences. There are things that you can't change. There are things that are hardwired into us that if you try to change this, you're going to damage your spouse and damage the marriage. So here's some of the God differences, an example. The first is our major needs. The men and women were completely different related to our major needs. So here are the major needs of men and the major needs of women. Number one, the need of men is respect. We need respect. We're very fragile in our egos. And some women think that's just, we're egotistical and they need to keep us humble. And so, and Karen did to some degree when we first got married, it's, we need respect. It's our number one need. Number two is sex. Most men are more sexual than their wives. About 30% of women are more sexual than their husbands. You always meet each other's needs. Doesn't matter who's more sexual. Number three is friendship. We want to be buddies with our wives. We had a mother. We don't want another one. And uh, we want to be friends. We want to hang out with you. Number four is domestic support. We, when we want our wives to be domestically centered. Now, men should do their equal share of the household chores. But women just know how to nest. They know how to turn a house into a home. And we like living in the place that you create. And we just don't have that ability. So respect, sex, friendship, domestic support, those are the four major needs of a man. Four major needs of a woman, security is number one. Uh, a selfless, sacrificial man makes her feel secure. A selfish, detached man makes her feel insecure. And so she needs security. Number two, open and honest communication. She wants you to talk to her. She, she doesn't want headlines. She wants you to open up. And she says, how are, you, how are you doing? How was your day? She doesn't want to hear, it's fine. Who'd you talk to? Nobody. What'd you do? Nothing like that. She wants you to say, well, at 6.13 a.m. this morning, I came into consciousness. <laughs> and I was feeling a little insecure about my meeting that was coming up with Bob. And like that, she wants, that, she wants you to cough it up, like that, including talking about all your feelings that you don't have. And <laughs> soft, non-sexual affection is one of her major needs. 
She wants to know that she's important for reasons other than sex. And she wants you to be soft and non-sexual with her. And leadership, she doesn't want you to dominate her, but she wants you to be the loving initiator of children, uh, the discipline, raising the kids, romance, spirituality, finances, and things like that. She wants you to be a loving leader. It's one of her most important needs. So security, open and honest communication, soft and non-sexual affection, and leadership. And so the question is, why does, why does God do that? Why does, he, why does he make us so different? Why does he make us the same? Wouldn't it be great to be married? You wake up and you say, you know what I'm thinking? I say, yeah, sure do. <laughs> you know what I want to do today? Yeah, I know, I know what you want to do. I want to do that same thing. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It, but why, do, why does God do this kind of stuff to us? Well, so let me say this. In Mark 10, Jesus is telling his disciples, this is verse 45, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. He said, I didn't come to, to be served, I came to serve. And he told the disciples that the servant is the greatest of all, not to be like the Gentiles who lord over each other, but to be a servant. John 13, Jesus washed the disciples' feet at the Last Supper. John 21 the resurrected Jesus cooked breakfast for his disciples at the Sea of Galilee and served it to them. The resurrected Jesus cooked breakfast and served it to his disciples. This is Luke 12. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. For when, when he returns from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat, and we'll come and serve them. You know what he's saying? When the rapture happens and we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, Jesus is going to serve a supper. When you're, when you're waiting for me and you're ready for me, I'm going to come and get you and I'm going to take you and you're going to sit down and eat and I'm going to gird myself and serve you. So here's what I'm saying. Jesus Christ is an eternal servant. He wasn't play acting when he was on the earth. He was acting like a servant. That's his nature. He serves us 24 hours a day. He's our Lord. He's our master. He's our intercessor. He's our healer. He's serving us 24. He loves to serve. And he created every relationship in his kingdom to only operate with servants. The greatest marriage in the world is two servants in love. The worst marriage in the world is two selfish people. And let me, let me say this. Okay? In marriage, you'll serve or you'll suffer. You'll serve or you'll suffer. To the degree that you serve, you'll succeed. To the degree that you want you to suffer in marriage. And so in marriage... It only works if we have the character of Christ. And the character of Christ is not being selfish, it's serving. And so, what, I can't meet my own needs. If I could meet my own needs, I wouldn't have gotten married. I got married because I couldn't meet my own needs. But Karen can meet my needs and I, I can meet her needs. So understand, every man has what his wife needs, every woman has what her husband needs. And so, not only can I not only meet my own needs, I married you, now I can't shop in any other stores. I married you, and I have to shop at your store. And your shelves are empty, and you have a bad attitude. And now I'm hostage. That's what happens to marriages when you don't serve each other. Rather than saying, baby, what do you need? Here, here's the mantra of selfishness. If I'm okay, we're okay. Here's the mantra of servanthood. I'm not okay until you're okay. You okay? Anything you need, I can do for you. So Jesus, our needs are completely different. And to have a happy spouse, you're going to have to serve them, and you're going to have to meet needs that you don't have. And your spouse comes up to you, your wife says, I want, to, I want to talk. And you're thinking, I don't need to talk. <laughs> Can you just hold me? Don't need that either. It doesn't matter what you need. It, it doesn't matter what you need. It matters what they need. And when they say to you they have a need, you meet that need. And I'm saying to the degree that we serve each other, we are happy. To the degree that we don't, you'll also be miserable in marriage. Because marriage only works through a servant spirit. Number two difference, how do you reconcile those differences? By serving. That's how you reconcile it. Okay, the second difference, example of difference, are money languages. And I, I think I've taught this here before years ago. But Karen and I, this was the most toxic issue in our marriage early on. We couldn't talk about money. We just, we just had the worst knockdown, drag out fights related to money. And then one day I saw an article. It was from a guy named Kenneth Doyle, who is a financial psychologist at the University of Minnesota. And he found that related to money, there are four money languages. We just see money differently. Is that, you know, even though you think, you think we see money the same, and like this money here, there's $10 here, is you think that we all see that the same? We don't see that the same. We see money very differently. And so he, he said there are four money languages, and here's what they are. N number one money language is driver. And when a driver sees money, it's, it's, they see success. 
To them, money just means success. It protects against the fear of incompetence. An amiable, money means love. They, they see the same money, but to an amiable, money means love. Okay? It, uh, relationships and people are the focus of their financial desires. Money means love and affection. The third type of money language is analytic. Money means security. It wards off chaos and problems. And so many people who are savers, that money means security. Expressive, money means acceptance and respect. And so uh, I'll be able to shop and we'll be able to be a part of the right groups of people and uh, belong to places we want to belong and things like that. Driver, money means success. Amiable, money means love. Analytic, money means security. Expressive, money means acceptance and respect. Well, I'm an amiable. Karen is an analytic. And so to me, money means love. To Karen, money means security. So we had these knockdown drag out fights when we got married and Karen was calling me a spendthrift and I would call her a tightwad. And, you know, we, I mean, it was just, she would say, well, you, Jimmy, you're just spent here. Oh, I hate it when she said it. And I said, Karen, you're one of those kind of people there. You're going to die with all your money in a mattress and nobody will like you. <laughs> and she said, at least I'll have a mattress. <laughs> and, oh, drove me crazy. So what we found out was in marriage, you can have different answers and both be right. Because we're both right. So when we talk about money, we used to, condemn each other and come down on each other and judge each other and call each other names. Well, we haven't had a money fight in many, many years. Money's a blessing in our marriage. Well, how do we make decisions? We respect each other. And we'll have a conversation and we'll say, what about this and this? And I'll give my two cents and Karen gives her two cents. There's no judging. There's no arguing because we're better together. We make, and this, this is the way I say it, and that is our, our family, our marriage, we're safer because of Karen and we're funner because of me. You know, if there was two of me, we'd be broke. If there was two of her, they'd be living in a cave in Utah. You know, so, the, so we need each other. And most of you have different money languages as a spouse. And so you make better decisions if you're different. If you're the same, you both have the same strengths, but you also have the same weaknesses. And so with Karen and me, we have different money languages and the issue is respected. By the way, here's the reconciling of this. God saw Adam by himself and said, that's not good. And every other thing that God created on this earth, he looked at and said it was very good, except for a man by himself. And he created Eve, it says, a helper comparable. Not another Adam, an Eve. Fill in his gaps. He didn't make two Adams. He made Eve like this. And here's what it means. I'm incomplete. I'm incomplete. Karen completes a part of me, and she's different than me. And that's why in marriage, you can have two different answers and both be right, because you're Two halves of the brain. She brings a perspective. I bring a perspective. And if we respect, here's how you reconcile that. You respect each other. And you realize, it's like, if 11 quarterbacks ran on the field, wouldn't that be awkward? That, that's not a team. That's a support group. You need all the positions covered. There's a wife and a husband. And you both play different positions. But you're in the same marriage. And so you're having a conversation about the kids. You're having a conversation about money. You're having a conversation about this or this. And you both have different answers. But you're both right. And you respect each other and you make better decisions together. Rather than feeling low, though you have to be right and your spouse has to be wrong. And so let me say one more thing real quick. Another difference is strengths. Now there's a deal called Clifton Strength Finder. And there are 34 strengths. And this is on Gallup.com. It's an assessment tool. And you answer all these questions, and then they t tell you your top five strengths. It's a, really good. I wrote a book on it years ago. But strategic thinking, relationship building, influencing, and executing, those are the four areas where they break it down. But I want to show you Karen's top five strengths and my top five strengths here for just a minute, because this was really helpful to us. I think these are going to come up on the screen here. Karen's number one is empathy. Remember, there's 34 strengths. Empathy, that just means she feels a lot. She's she very... She says, I can walk into a room and tell you how everybody's feeling. And I tell her, I can walk into a room and I don't care. And <laughs> developer, she's a really good discipler. Karen's real patient with people. She's a really good developer of people. Restorative means she likes solving problems and she's good at it. Responsibility, she's a very responsible person. And harmony, she likes to get along and help other people to get along. So empathy, developer, restorative, and harmony. My thought five strengths are completely different. Number one is achiever. And I like to get things done. I'm a get-it-done guy. I love to achieve. I like lists. 
When I go to bed at night, I think about all the things I got done that day, and that makes me feel good. Self-assurance just means I feel, feel good. about My assurance is in God. But number three is command, because I can stand up here and do this. Number four is relater. I like people, and I like relationships. Number four, I'm a learner. And so when I saw the strengths here, uh, when we took this test, I thought, well, that's Karen, and that's me. That's, that's who we are. And uh, so here's the interesting thing about our test. Now, Karen is empathy. That's my number 34. Karen's number one is my number 34. And, you know, Karen says, how are you feeling? I said, I don't know. Fine, I guess. She said, no, you don't. She'll tell me how I'm feeling. <laughs> and she's always right. You know, like my friend said, I knew I married Mrs. Wright. I just didn't know her first name was always. And she's always right. And she'll say, this is how you feel like that. Because I just, I'm not in touch with my feelings. And so she, and she reminds me of this all the time. And so that is my number 34. And if, if Jesus would have come to me, I want you to look at what I'm saying. If Jesus would have come to me years ago and said, Jimmy, here's a magic wand. You can change anything about Karen you want to change. I'd have taken away all those feelings. <laughs> I'll get rid of all those feelings she has. And I would have destroyed the strongest area of her life. So in, in my category here, achiever is my number one. That's her number 34. That's, that's her. Now, she's, she's very diligent. But we're redoing our bathroom. Pray for us. We're remodeling our bathroom right now. And Karen, because it's our bathroom, she's in charge of the project. And so I think back in like September, October, we decided to remodel our bathroom. And so when, I'm, when I have a project, is I'm just very... It's just, it's happening, and I'm making sure it's happening because I'm an achiever. So Karen, we, you know, like, look, we're going to remodel the bathroom. Good. We made that decision. We're going to remodel our bathroom. Well, she's in charge, of course, and we've been married 50 years, so I know how this works. So I said, about a month later, I said, have you talked to a builder? And she said, well, I think I'm going to talk to the neighbors because some of them have been remodeling their houses. I'm going I'm to ask them if they, how they like their people. I said, okay. So a couple weeks later, have you talked to the neighbors? No, nah, I, think, I think I'm going to talk to Nicole. I think Nicole, she's our realtor. I think Nicole would probably know somebody. A couple weeks later, have you talked to Nicole? Yeah, she gave me a guy's name. You gonna call him? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna call him. And, and so this, I've been married 50 years. That means back off, Jack. <laughs> back off. A couple weeks later, did, did you call him? Yeah. So what happened? He's coming out next week. This is like, so I'm, I'm, I'm on a stopwatch. She's on a calendar. At the end of this project, I think I'm going to believe in evolution. And, <laughs> but, so, 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 so why did God put us together? Why did God put someone with these feelings with someone without feelings? And I've got feelings. You know, I've got feelings like and the Rangers lost last night, so I'm very sad about that. <laughs> and so, but why would God put an achiever with someone like this? And here's the way I said, Karen is the anchor behind my ship that keeps me from hitting an iceberg. And I thank God for her. For years, I just thought she's holding me back. She is holding me back. She's keeping me, if it was just me, I'd self-destruct. And so I'm in her life to help her with her weaknesses, to strengthen her weaknesses. She's in my life to strengthen my weaknesses. Let me say this to you. So I would say, ask this question, did God put you together? If you're married, did God put you together? And you say, yes. He put your weaknesses together. He put your strengths together. He did this. And this is what drives us crazy a lot of times. Actually, what drives you crazy about your spouse is many times their greatest strength. And what drive, drives you crazy is it's your weakness. And you may be the same in some areas, but I'm saying it's very common to look at a God-given difference in your spouse and despise it because it's different than you. And my friend in Houston, he said, my wife just drove me crazy. I, just, I, I thought I wouldn't be able to take it anymore. She just drove me so crazy. And I said, why? And he said, every time I said anything or did anything, she would say something to make it better. And he said, I went out and painted the fence out front. And she'd say, did you paint the fence on the side too? Did you do this? Did you do that? And he said, I just, I just thought, nothing's ever good enough for her. Her strength is maximizer. That's her number one strength. A maximizer is always trying to make things better. And he said, when we took the test, I found out she's a maximizer. I realized what I despised the most was her greatest strength. She, she's not criticizing. She's just trying to make things better. So I'm saying to you, we have differences. We have differences. Some of those differences are bad. They have to go away. And the four laws erase all the bad differences. 
But there are God differences. God made you different and he puts your differences together and you have to serve and you have to be humble and realize you're incomplete. You need each other and you have to respect each other. And to the degree that you do that, those irreconcilable differences go away and your differences become dynamic rather than being dangerous. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of marriage and thank you for the gift of each other. And Lord, I just pray that you'll help us in our hearts to make the changes that we need to make to serve our spouse, to honor them, to respect them, Lord. I pray you'll bless every marriage, every campus, every service. And Jesus, you said, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And I pray, Jesus, that you'll bind us together, spirit to spirit, as married couples, with a new and greater bond. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, go ahead and keep your heads bowed right there just a moment longer. And as Pastor Jimmy was speaking, maybe Holy Spirit was also stirring some things in your heart. So just continue to receive from him. And I would love to give an opportunity for anyone who is here today that has never made Jesus the Lord of their lives. The Bible is very clear that Jesus is at the door of your heart and he's knocking. And the best place for him to be is not on the side of our lives, but the center of our lives. So if you're here today and you say, you know what? I wanna make Jesus the Lord of my life. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So right there where you are with every head bowed and eyes closed, if you wanna make a decision for Jesus, just repeat this prayer um, after me. Just say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for loving me first. I give you my life and I receive the forgiveness of my sins. Thank you for taking them on yourself. And right now I choose to make you my Lord and I'm gonna follow you and I ask that you help me. In Jesus name, amen. Church family, you can look up at me and let's put our hands together, come on. For everyone who made a decision for Jesus today, we want you to know we're so proud of you. We're so thankful for you. In fact, here in just a moment, we're gonna take communion together. So our communion team, go ahead and make your way down to the front. Um, if you did not get one of these elements on your way in, please raise your hand and our team will give you one of these. Um, if you did make a decision for Jesus, we would love to support you and, and help you know what your next